Dana, this is Rob Schneider, our good bud, who uh, I can't mm-hmm. believe it's taking this long. We got Rob on. He's one of our pals. Yeah. We've grown ups and a million other things. Orgasm guy. Uh, sensitive, <laughs> sensitive naked man. man. You remember that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. funny. It was quirky. Right. So I'm going to ask you, yeah, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Do you want to hear about my monkey's audition or my Lorne phone call or my oh, mom's Well, let's feet? start with the monkey's audition. Okay, that's yeah. it. I'll just do one for this intro. Okay. Because we got to talk about yeah, Rob. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. it's not all about us. Mm-hmm. Which it usually is on the podcast. <laughs> Well, I go, thanks, guest. That reminds me of a 22 minute story. It's like a long joke. Two narcissists start a podcast. At the, the, <laughs> the guest is the whole time like, what are you going? Can I, if I could jump in, I had a quick question, just maybe an <laughs> anecdote. <laughs> you know, because, um, yes, you know, you kind of swallow and smack your lips, you know, because, uh, you know, I'm allergic to uh, podcasting, you see, because, <laughs> you see, yeah. because I don't need me to be didactic or facetious, but as of this moment, I haven't said a word. It's, I knew it's a guy an hour 20. who went to dinner at his house and, and, and he said, Woody had five Heinekens in a row and never, a. and never used the bathroom, never was intoxicated. And the, the guy said, Woody, you, you, you have five Heinekens and never used the restroom. He goes, yeah, it's my special talent. If that's true, it's hilarious. That's that's word for word true. Okay, so let, I'll I'll do this one on the next one, Monkey's Audition. But this one is okay. uh, Rob Schneider. Um, what can you say? He's got a career. He's got movies. He's got the hot chick, which had Rachel McAdams. Kind of not discovered her, but he had, he had Anna Faris and Rachel Adams. I think. Yeah, the thing about Rob, which I it was fun to revisit, that he is quite a storyteller. Yes, and you're going to enjoy this episode because. He takes his time. One of the reasons the episode went so long is because he's such a great storyteller. Yeah. And he would, he'll come at these things comprehensively, like this part, that part, that part, and get to it, which is really nice for podcasting. So, so much fun. And uh, he sings. Oh, yeah. He does a lot of uh, funny little accents and stuff. He just has a million accents. He has so, so many characters yeah. and accents. Yeah. He breaks down his catchphrase, Adam Sandler, famous catchphrase. I read for that, Dana. For you can do it. Yeah, I go and I go. You can do it. <laughs> I did it like too dramatic, and Adam was like, "Thank you. We'll let you know." I, you know, my thing. I went and read too, and I just, I just. What'd you do? I went a little sexy. You can do it. Really? And it was screaming at a at a football game, and that was yeah, your choice. Yeah, I just didn't read the script. I just <laughs> went and go. You can I go, do I it. I read the script. It's funny, and it's great. Oh, it's I great. Know, it's great, Harvey. But uh, next time, <laughs> next time, time maybe <laughs> maybe skim the just a page of the script when it says stadium <laughs> full of people. No, I did not read for you could do it, but Rob, uh, he he's the only one who could do it. Copy machine. We go through that. It's yeah. great. Massive Edwin Harry and Il Cantori. We break down those, which the I big to news, hear. which I shouldn't say. Mm-hmm. Didn't he? Did he write fucking Massive Head with him? I it was his. I'm That's sure unreal. you know. It's then people would could the chime monster. in, but the it was Rob's, and he will tell you. I thought it was handy. stories about what happened at the end of Mass. Massive Headwind Harry, because what happened was a little incendiary involving an animal, and there was a method to the madness. Yes. How's that for a tease? I'm teasing more now. And this one's a two-parter, and uh, mm-hmm. or as I call it, a two-farter. No, I don't. Actually, I don't say that. This is all. This is great. You're in here. These are just really fun because I can get a a sense of you. You know, like if. Usually Something's Zoom. wrong, or you're bored, or <laughs> you're suppressing a yawn. <laughs> Your eyes darting. <laughs> that face that says, why did I say yes? <clears throat> no, Greg, I, I, can I, we I, start it? It's going. Okay. Oh, we're already going. This, oh, we're we're going. already halfway done. Oh, boy. <laughs> Wait, should, can I use We're almost done. One quick? last question for oh, yeah. Rob. I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in an hour. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll deal with this guy. You, there's one down here, dude. So many thoughts were flying Go through my head. Go to bathroom 38. It's straight across. So many thoughts were flying through my head. Um, you just have to field questions. It's easier. On the way here. You know, I'll wait for Dana to come back. But yeah, like the, um, Hurry, Dana. No, the, the thing about um, you, David, was you had a... Uh, you were unlike me. I, mean, I would go to life and like there was like a very Asian thing, very Chinese thing. And I worked, I did a movie with Jean Claude Van Damme in China. It was a different uh, thing, and this is going to come back to you eventually. But what happened was, if there was a um, um, 
in the the Western world, if if there is a um, a problem, you look at it and go, okay, well, these are the tools that we need. Uh, this is how long it's going to take, and these are the amount of people we're going to get. Now, uh, in China, it was the exact opposite. They'd run to a place <laughs> with the people that they had, figured out what the problem was there, and use the tools that they could. So it was, in other words, it was like a lot of things blowing up on set, you know, <laughs> and mm-hmm. like you know the gen, uh, you know the generator or whatever getting rained on and blowing up and so but you figured out things quicker like oh. for instance you were like when i first met david at an acting class what? here in town oh, that's right you um you kind of figured out where the good looking girls who the good looking girls <laughs> were, we were and, who, and who and then you also had like instead of like you know when i moved down here i moved into like a dump Mm-hmm. And then, like you, you buy like the one piece of furniture, and then I went to your house, and you had a, a scam worked out way ahead of time, which is like you moved in with a really good-looking older woman. You just rented a room in her house, and the place was tricked out already. Oh right, she you already had a had beautiful it. couch. Yeah. She had like, I mean, first of all, a couch was like a big deal to me. Yeah, a nice. And then she had stuff on the walls. She had nothing on the walls. She had you know refrigerator, and you just worked out this delicate situation with her. And I went like, holy shit, I would have never figured that out. <laughs> it was I was looking at the paper. <laughs> That's our David. <laughs> I was looking at the paper for places to live and, and on my own, I couldn't click and get one and it was too expensive. And then hers was $400, but she already had a two bedroom. So I just went and met random people. Yeah. And then it was in Toluca Lake and it had a room. She mm-hmm. had the big room and she had the whole place beautifully done. I would just <laughs> yeah. walk in, skim through the kitchen. You could <laughs> keep stuff in the fridge. She was very nice. And I just go in my room. So that's all I needed. I had a room with a bed and then a little desk and then a TV in the corner so I could write, pick up the phone, <laughs> hear your messages, and then sleep. So that's all I needed. And it really- but she was also a very attractive- she, yeah, That was random. Older woman. And when I say At older, I mean she was 30, which was like- was For us, yeah. that was like and a really crazy attractive. old girl. It was like <laughs> Mrs. Robinson. Yeah. And we, and I never even and flirted like, with her. And I figured this out? But she was Spade too old. out of my league, too pretty. She was an actress and she was- four, five years older than us, six years, seven years older. Yeah. Which is a and, huge- Which is huge. And big jump. I could, it was weird to talk to girls our age. We had no confidence back then. And we were just like, and she was so great. But then I think the day I left, she's like, oh, you know, we never dated. Wow. And I was like, you could have said something. I was stayed there 11 years. <laughs> well, you know what? I stayed there all during SNL. Mary Lou Henner, who we're talking about, <laughs> uh, <laughs> said to me, uh, can I set the scene for 30 seconds? You know, sure. I, you know, I do this for the audience. Yeah. So this yeah. is a trifecta of people who've known each other for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll talk about Rob and I doing stand up in San Francisco in the early days <laughs> for him. He was like at, at eighth grade. Always. I don't know, but he was always great. <laughs> and then great. how I intersected with you at Neons yeah. will be said in the podcast. And then you two hooking up. Dennis Miller gets in there. Next thing you know, I get on SNL. And then here come Schneider and Spade. I just wanted to set the yes. table that we've known each other a long time. Yeah, there was a thing, but because we were on, I mean, I want to get to the, the Dana track of it all. I'm going to interview you guys. The But you had a, a way of, of figuring things out. And then what I, what I one thing, because I've been listening <laughs> to the podcast, was the psychological makeup that for people who get, for comedians who get on SNL. And like, I've been like- Interesting. Deep into uh, this uh, kind of, um, well, I, I would call it like emotional damaged people. <laughs> and sure. like I consider it's myself that. Check. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you know what it was like? It's like, it's gotta be one parent who's missing, mm. uh, unavailable, either mm-hmm. physically or emotionally. And another one trying to make up for it, who has also got a problems because she's with somebody who's emotionally and physically not available. And so that was the kind of the click. Wow, that was mine exactly. So, there is something about that, like, you know, who's not there. And it's just depending on who, you know, yeah. like and then you, that other parent tries to make up for it and can never completely. But at the same time, like also the youngest person in the family, you know, the, there's the, the thing youngest. about the youth. Or, you know, sometimes it's an older one who felt like they had to clean up for everybody else in the family. There's, there's a weird thing, though, where, like, you know, there was missing something, so you felt like you had to go out in the world and try to get it. So gross, but pretty accurate. What about the, <laughs> uh, and then that begats resiliency. If you have dysfunctional parents, you become the adult in a way. And then show business, which is an emotionally violent sport. Because I want to ask you guys, like, yeah. you bomb that night or an SNL person's there and you don't do well. 
you just go through a landfill and then who it's a darwinian thing like who survives the game of thrones of early stand up how do you not give yes. up gets makes friends other people up the food chain recognize in your case your guys stood out from all the young comedians on a tier below me and for your writing and everything else and like how did you deal rob so you how, how did you fight through this or were you uh, like, how did you get on? <laughs> I think it was a combination of extremely Sorry. vulnerable and extremely hypersensitive. I remember when I was in okay. second grade, because, you know, my mom's is was Filipino. She just recently passed away. Asian oh, and a really tough war survivor. And she was, uh, and and I've, I've through therapy, through uh, Dr. Gabor Mate, who's an amazing Hungarian therapist he's like it's it's like he would call it generational trauma in other words that's passed on to you i didn't even realize about this so like but we would eat weird things and my friends wouldn't want to they wouldn't come over to the house twice once you see like uh, you know somebody's mom <laughs> sucking the eyes out of a fish and crunching it in front of them Literally? they don't come back for that second meal <laughs> so that's it so that that's the and so well, but, what but, but that's the way sticks? i grew up so there would be like you know you go to your other friends there weren't like heads you don't go to a place and there's like you know the head of a fish I like there the or the head of the <laughs> shrimp and stuff but i loved that but it was embarrassing because you, you were taught to love it and you, and so, you didn't even know what you were eating <laughs> is, is it okay for you right now to do your mom talk Ex ex explaining that yes, to your friends, it, like it is. You, now I can. How she but sounded. I'm, I'm in my face, but but see what? And it was this. It's very harsh. That's what I was Robert, doing. His mom. It was. It was literally like my bye whole bye. child was okay. Robert. It was just literally like just just you know, <laughs> if if not physically, emotionally, kind of jumping back. But I remember being in second grade. Being at the tide pools because that's what you do if you're a California kid. Yeah, you're, you're they don't they don't take you to the zoo. It's cheaper to just go to like the ocean and see if there's anything over there. Pacifica and I, yeah, in Northern yeah, California. In so we went to the tide pool, and then I remember picking up one of these things that we would eat. You know, it would be an Asian thing, like a little clam or something. <laughs> or something. And I said, this smells good. I, I eat, and I remember the teacher saying, ew, Robert, that's disgusting. Put it down. And that's when I realized, I said, at seven years old, I said, I am way more sensitive than any of the other kids in my in my class. And that's my weakness. Yeah. And I, 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 I knew that right then. And that was, and then it took 20 years to realize, well, that's also your strength. So it's a combination yeah. of the two things, extreme sensitivity, but also like, you know, and my parents were like, you know, it was like being raised by 12 year olds, you know, my, my mother first, cause that was when her trauma happened when, you know, in the Philippines and the Japanese came over and both her brothers were, were murdered by the Japanese. And so that hmm. trauma from that time, she would, whenever she had problems, she would revert to that because that was her survival mechanism. So when she was mad at my dad, I remember coming home and seeing every glass, every plate in the whole house that she could reach on the floor broken. And my yeah. brother would just go, hey, you got to wear your shoes today in the house. Uh -huh. There's another Asian. And how old were you at, like, at that point when you see the broken glass? You're uh, like six, seven, eight? Mm. Yeah, like young. Like really, under, really under, a, an impressionable time. Impressionable. That, that doesn't yeah. never and get, the childhood just, fucks with you. And you laugh at it. And then the yeah. dad would come home, Marvin would come home, and the mature guy would come home, mm -hmm. and he would ever think my mom couldn't reach, he'd break. And so we'd come home to and even you'd it see out. nothing but broken stuff. And it's like, this is, this is normal. It didn't happen every day, but there was that, that was representative of like, whoa. There's a landmine here. So, but it did make you tough. And I remember like going back well, to stand up. Yeah. When you're, I just remember the sensation of bombing. And I said, okay, this is, has to be instructional. And this is kind of a thing of being tough. And this is you in high school, right? When high you start saying, yeah. okay. Bombing. Cause it's like, you know, you, <laughs> David, you can relate to this too. It's like when you're performing and you don't, you're not an adult, people mm. are concerned about you. <laughs> you're <laughs> being in a club, there's alcohol there. They're not relaxed and they have mm -hmm. to be relaxed. Mm -hmm. To watch and 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 to sure. Be and so I just remember eating it so hard one time, bombing on stage. The physical, <laughs> the physical feeling of it. And I said, okay, remember what this is. As I was walking off stage, the only thing I can describe it as, it felt like my ears were melting off of my head. And yeah, sometimes when I get off, when it's such oh. a bomb, it feels like the Hurt Locker where a bomb goes off. She's like, ee! <laughs> and everyone's talking, you can't see their mouth. You're just walking off, going. Because well, you're thinking of so many things, like what that. went wrong, what was going on, and, and how everyone's repelled from you because you bombed and they don't want to be near you. And, <laughs> and, oh, and But I, I didn't quit. And I was saying it was like officer and a gentleman. I got nowhere else to go. I didn't really – I didn't have any other plan. Once I started doing stand-up, I quit school. And then I go, I have to keep doing this because I'm not – good at anything but it's, you know? it's instructional <laughs> though because at the same time what i didn't realize and now is it realized you know through 
years of, of therapy. <laughs> like, I yeah. feel like I'm Charles Grodin. Charles Grodin when, would talk to By the way, you. when did you start? <laughs> I'm stealing your therapy because I- Therapy I, at 15? No, 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 15 oh. therapy. Oh God, on and off for years. But the last okay. few years, pretty good. All right, so go back. You said Charles so, Grodin. <laughs> Charles Grodin would be, when you talk to him, he talked to you like- he said he basically treated everybody like they were just getting out of drug rehab, you know. So every conversation, every word was kind of like this, you know. Oh. So very gentle, so that everybody. So and it's it's just it's it's too much, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, when, well, when did you talk with Charles Grodin? I'm sorry, just, no, no, Charles Grodin. Well, he remember he had his, he had a talk show. There oh, on you went on MSNBC, yeah. one of those. Yeah, and they, he had one of those guys. He was like a therapist. Said, this is too much therapy. Phyllis the, Diller is here. <laughs> you know, I knew him for a while. But the, the, yeah. the idea of it though is instructional. Now that I think about it, because you mm -hmm. do have to melt away the ego. You have to kind of start from zero to do stand up. To risk yeah. yourself, to risk humiliation, you got to let go of that ego and this I stuff. Didn't, and, and I'm you sure start we all didn't have much up. ego though. Huh? We did. We all didn't have much ego then i mean it was more like i didn't think i was a good stand-up i was trying to be a good one and i was sort of all broken down into the bits anyway so any any elevation we got to there was a point when rob and i were pretty much from dave becky the guys that booked like the improv stuff were pretty much two of the best middles out yeah. there getting i think a thousand each that was a lot for yeah seven i mean they, shows. they don't for get a that week. now yeah yeah, yeah. You, you could, they'd fly you somewhere yeah, and, and give they you put like you in the thousand, condo. The condo. And he was like, the they'd pay you as much as twelve fifty or fifteen hundred a weekend. Wait, what? Which was crazy. <laughs> you got <more> <laughs> Wait, I think I capped out at a thousand, and that's when we got SNL because we were friendly. We were friendly with uh, Drake Sather. We knew maybe Apatow, Sandler. There were some guys in the Valley doing the Valley Improv. And, all <laughs> and then when we got, mm. we SNL. never had more. We never were good headliners, but we were monster middles. Yeah. We didn't realize how hard. You Head both open for me. I'll say at the end of the podcast, <laughs> who was the hardest guy to follow? <laughs> we actually have a clip yeah. here. I'm going to say, I was one a second go back to the ego thing, because yeah, I think yeah. that's really interesting. Did, did you guys have a sense, even if it was here and there, like a sneaky ego, or kind of like, I think I might be able to do this. Like maybe you were the funny guy in seventh grade or you did a book report and they laughed. So that's the problem. You mm. might've had a little bit of a sneaky <laughs> ego of like, I yeah. think I can do this. See, I, this is one thing I would you know. respectfully disagree with you on that, David. Yeah, it's I'm, gigantic ego, it's fragile and extreme sensitivity, extreme vulnerability. And that combination God, is right. show business. It's such a horror well, show. I it am. is, it is. Because of what it is, but what, it, what happens is once you have that monster thing that happened yeah. like for me it was in high school mm -hmm. where all of a sudden i was the funny guy and then yeah. and then all, everything changed like girls who would never yeah. look at me looked at me and then that was it that's my end so that was the the one kernel that would keep you going because you said this can really work i know i can do this i murder with my friends mm -hmm. and so that combination of of that and then so when you're bombing and stuff you go this is this could work this could work right and, you know? and but you're not with your friends anymore and that's the way people say i'm the funniest guy at my office when you go to a stage hard where no to one knows that to the audience, though, uh, seriously, well, I think right. it's part of, part of the charisma, and I think with you guys too, it's sort of like that likability comes from the vulnerability. But get out of the way, I'm the shit. You know, it's like it's yeah. like Elvis Presley, which you played in, in, in uh -huh. Hawaii, Elvis in Japan. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to <laughs> get to that in a second. But I do think the charisma, because I there were alpha male comics. They were like bludgeoning the audience and killing with just sort of energy and energy and loudness, uh, crowd work and stuff. And they didn't go as far as the sensitive guys who also could be strong. And also, you guys are both great writers. Let's we'll get to that later. I hate to say that, well, but it, you really were. <laughs> we're getting to nothing <laughs> Thank now. Thank you. The, Everything's later. Well, I, you had to recognize, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, to be Stay successful. Two for part two. <laughs> I did recognize it. That when I was doing stand-up, and I, you know, we kind of, you have a couple of good moments or whatever, some joke, yeah. but then you see people uh, who, you know, and I didn't have the, the confidence, and sometimes you, you kind of get a little of it, but then you see people who are really confident and not talented. Yeah, you had to recognize, that's, that's and I didn't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> that. That didn't make sense to me. It's like, why is that guy confident? And they're that? headliners, and you're like, confident, confident but not talented. <laughs> yeah. So with that, and you had to recognize, okay, what's the difference? How am I going to make it? You walk into a place in 1982, 83, yeah. there's 30 comics and go, and, and but I did recognize just in those part of the strength that I that I did get from my you know my violent mother was like how are you going to make it how am I going to make it and these guys probably aren't what's going to be the difference <laughs> yeah and I, I, I would make that thought yeah yeah you know and I, I got to make I got to work hard on these guys and also I got to get rid of anything in my act that they're talking about 
Yeah, that's the hard part. If you, the more stuff mm. you have, a side note about yourself, least likely it's going to bump with someone else. Because when I go up and the guy, and I'm like a middle on the headliner goes, you're going before me? Yeah. And I, he goes, okay, don't do anything about Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, driving. And I go, that's my fucking whole act. So <laughs> I, I'm not allowed to do because it, it bumps with his, which is something that happens. Uh, the other switch for me and Rob is jumping ahead. After SNL, we could headline and we weren't, weren't quite ready. And the, the biggest thing about headlining for me that was harder was A, following a good middle like a Rob, and then B, the mm-hmm. checks going out. The people at home don't know yeah. that when you're doing an hour set or four, even 45, around 25 or 30 minutes, the checks go down. And that means everyone needs to pay so they can get them out. Oh, they're and, doing math. They're co- and, and everyone and stops closer. laughing. Yeah. They just go look at their check and go, hey, who had two Cokes? Did you have the what's, curly fries? <laughs> what's 10% yeah. of 179? What's 3%? Yeah. Of, and then everyone's mm-hmm. like talking. And then you go, wait, that joke usually kills it. And people never warn me, oh, the checks go out right about then. And there's some comics that say, don't put the checks out until I'm off, which is, I don't mind it anymore. fucks the waiters over because, you know, yeah. I never say that because you got, if you can get through that hump, then you're good again. Because yeah, if you're when, killing. when you hit that hole and you go, oh no, the checks went out my head. I see someone like slow motion going, oh, let me get my visa. I go, oh my God, everyone's getting them right now and no one's listening. And then you got to bring them back for your closer. You got to somehow keep them around. It's, it's, I, it's warfare. I got out of stand-up for 20 years because of that. Because I just like, I respected the art form too much to do it. And if you're not doing it all the time, and I didn't want to eat it and blah, blah, blah. And I did like, I said, if I'm going to do this, I got to do it full time. And when people pay, you don't want to rip them off by doing like a yeah, half Yeah, I don't want to feel, I don't want to do a celebrity victory lap. So I had to jump back into it hard. And I did. And it's been like, now I'm ready to get out of it again. You know, the you name know? of my tour is Celebrity Victory Lap. So I feel so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I well, what happens is, so is you guys, you guys are just middle. So you have like, like a thirty when you got on 20, SNL. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. I'm trying to be generous. Yeah. I'm a nice guy. Twenty five. Okay. You had fifteen. <laughs> you had ten Solid good minutes 15. anyway, and some filler. And some so then you work. get on SNL and you become the bad boys of comedy, and you both have this great run in the '90s on SNL. Okay. Which and then all of a sudden you're end. being offered, can you go do an hour at a college for like twenty grand or fifteen oh. grand? But you don't have it, so what? That was what you, I broke at a certain point. I stopped doing stand up, but I remember where it was. It's like 90, 1992. It's four thousand people in Milwaukee, and I said, <laughs> "You're famous now." Now I'm famous, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I never had the thing where people are paying to see you before, and they're yelling out stuff that, yeah. that you know, <laughs> making yelling copies. <laughs> yeah, and it's during the day. It's during the day. During the day, also like gross. so they're sober. They're, well, they're not. Well, this is Milwaukee, so they're drinking during the day. <laughs> <laughs> they're all so, and then they do. They do. Uh, you do the show. And I got, I stumbled and I got through it and it was like, I gritted it out. And then there's two shows that day because they're paying you a lot of money. There's two, mm-hmm. two shows. And then I walk out there and, and I look and I go, it, the most frightening thing is it's the same. No. Crowd. Oh, no. And, they, and I got to do it again. The and same I said, crowd. I, I can't pull it off. Grotesque. I can't. What, what did you do? I can't go on? I, you... I, I just, I mentally broke. <laughs> And I got, start crying. Like, you know, it's, it's like, like a nightmare. No, but it's like you know, from doing stand up so much times. You know, when you're having the middle of like a set that ain't the best one. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you just, you just, you get through it because you're, you know, you're like a, you can go into that robot mode. And I remember yeah. talking to like it's a weird thing because you show up as you show up at a place, and I have made, and I, you're like this too, Dana. You'd say, I, what can, experience can I get out of this particular situation? And I do that. So I was on some show. I forget if it was Leno or Letterman or one of those things. And, I'm, and there's this, 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 this Asian violinist. She's like famous. I'm sorry, I forget her name now. But I said, how many days a year do you feel like on, on? And I said, and she said, well, I work 250, do 250 dates a year. I said, how many of those Oof. dates would you guess would she felt like at the top of her yeah, name? Yeah, good question. Do you know how many she said? I'm going to say two. Yeah. I got it. <laughs> Shut up. I was going to say said 240. She said two? Ding, 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 wow. ding. Because then David? you know exactly <laughs> yeah. that the, the little tiny thing. It's like, because when I went, first of all, Dana was the guy yeah. in San Francisco. There's two guys that like, that were like so talented that Hollywood came up. There was Robin Williams and Dana yeah. Carter who were so talented. You don't mind me saying, it's just a fact. You were famous before you were famous. They were so talented that Hollywood started coming up looking for, well, it's got to be, they're going making up them there up there to get them. Yeah. Look, well, there's more, but we'll, we'll, we'll t- okay, I guess we'll take that guy. And it was just like, right, like it's uh, comedy I was, town. I was like the yeah. third tier of mm-hmm. those guys. Wow, well, all right. Well, then him, he's young enough. There. Maybe he'll turn this yeah. on. But yeah. Dana would have lines around the block. And you know, performing for open mics, you don't really get the that audience. You can't really tell if your material kills or not, whatever. But 
When you're open for Dana Carvey, you have a chance to have a real audience who's there for comedy. Good comedy Who's crowd. excited about comedy. Yeah. Dana used to, part of his act, he used to be able to do stuff about people waiting in line for his next show. And then that was some of the funniest stuff in the show. Because it was like at the other cafe, there was like a, right. an open window. An open oh, you window. can see them through so the window? You see them waiting to come in. <laughs> and other comedians, we would just sit in the back and just watch and go like, okay, I said, well, we're good, but we can't do that. Yeah. Well, I had the same thing with Robin. I just kept thinking I got to get better every time he'd come up and levitate <laughs> the Holy that. City Zoo. And I was starting in college. So by the time you saw me, Rob, I had gotten – other cafe opened in 79, and that's sort of where I started to develop. I Hey, I could, the first time I did a character – yeah. For 30 seconds, it wasn't me. I was terrified. <laughs> so by the time I, that that club really, really saved me. Because, you know, you play the honky-tonk bars, the cowboy bars with the blender going. Yeah. And your act gets bluer and louder. But that was like a, it was a 60-seater. It was old it? hippies in they there. They rewarded the you. 70s? It's the difference know, between like liberals in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s, yes. which are like question authority. Yeah. Right. And like, and they go with you. And if you were taking more artistic license and sometimes like Grace Slick would be in the audience, you know, you'd mm. have like, it, mm -hmm. it was like, there were these cool, kind of the, what you, what I loved about San Francisco. Poetry was vibes. Was the bohemian vibe. Yes. And which was artistic and were supporting you like those, you know, the great, you know, Ferlinghetti and the, the, um, you know, the City Lights bookstore. It was a place you go. They printed their own books. So San Francisco had that vibe at that time. It still had it. It was eclectic, cool neighborhood. And, and yeah. now it's 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 gone. But but that was a really now it's it's have it's you not been to the gun down saloon there? It's not bad. <laughs> yeah. Last day stand up. But, there. but that was a place where they did reward you for going further. Topical. And, yes. And, and and would go and then so that was the <laughs> perfect place. Yeah. And uh, for for that and, and it, you really did get a chance to see and, and you were like you were f levitating on stage it was just you were floating and then the characters mm -hmm. that you would do you'd pummel an audience they were literally exhausted leaving rape and pillage <laughs> jeez Louise I'm loving this podcast we should take I know, our time enough. let's not let's not make this a rushy one let's uh, no, talk that's very about... nice Rob but when you appeared because I want to throw out some names because yeah. it's nostalgic so Rob and I. Came up from the San Francisco comedy scene, which you, you know, so and the comedy. Let me just interrupt for one second. And the and the comedy. The big thing back then was, if you were a comic, then was the San Francisco comedy competition. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. And which and the, huge. you didn't want to win it, but you mm -hmm. wanted to get top five. What was the yes. newspaper? But, but called? Dana would do this thing, and he told me this. Dana was like, Dana gave me nuggets, which I held to this day because, and it really was. And he he used to drive to the. I'll never forget this. When you drove to the comedy uh, competition. Because that was a lot of pressure, and the mm -hmm. talent scouts were coming, and it was a mm -hmm. big effing deal. Robin Williams, we that was a, 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 so. Yeah. And this was the time where it was like it was big. You would perform with like fifteen hundred people. Mm -hmm. It was that big. And the you competition. go through weeks of rounds to get yeah. to the finals, and yeah. then and and you would. And he told me said that Dana said that on the way to the place he would listen to the Beatles. It's getting better all the time. That's true. Yeah, a little better. What a weirdo. Better. Yeah. Isn't that kind of cool? It's a little sexy. But, like, <laughs> but, but you no, know, but he, because <laughs> and Dana would say things like this. I need to feel funny before I go on stage. No one told me that. He had to feel silly. He got himself in the place. So there was a methodology. He didn't just do it. And because sometimes you just see the after effect. Like we didn't see the college years and working your way up and yeah. watching Robin, having to follow Robin. We just saw the audience just sees what they see. Mm -hmm. So, but right to learn the craft and to learn at the high level that you were at, and just as a young man watching it, it's like, okay, that's that's how you do this. Mm -hmm. That was very instructional. And it, it, prepares you for SNL in a way. I mean, there's people who came up through Groundlings and stuff, which kind of take their sketch and put it on. Stand-up is so rough and tumble. You have to be so tough yeah. that on SNL, yeah. all you're trying to do, and it took me, I think, 80 shows, just to quiet that voice in the back of your head saying, this isn't going well. <laughs> I missed that line. Oh, yeah. I dropped that. Dress was better. I didn't commit like I did at dress. And so I wonder where you came in and when you felt like you got in the groove with SNL? Like, well, the, were you out, out of the box or 40 we were, shows? We in? did four shows in the 80, 89, 90 season. Yeah. They brought us in, which was like, it was a wonderfully, it was just amazing to just be there. You were like um, somebody, you know, Bernie Brillstein, who was, uh, you know, 
talent manager extraordinaire. Went and to the and stars he was also, and, but he, he would also give you to look, look. Yeah. One is going to not let you. One, <laughs> you're going to have to wait. And that's part of it. Is you wait. So it lets you know that you, uh, you, you are less important, but not in a bad way. But it's like, you got to know that the blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. and so you. So you, this is a famous talent manager. Right, also, managed Belushi and Belushi Aykroyd, Aykroyd telling you this. And Lauren. Yeah, listen. <laughs> and yeah. Lauren. It's and Lauren. So the thing about it was like, I mean, ridiculous. it actually, Lauren yeah, managed everybody. His whole, <laughs> Lauren Michaels, a famous, you know, comedy and, uh, you know. Legend. Legend who, who you know, launches careers would uh, would also have his system make it a little easier. So he would rather just, if you were in the Brillstein camp, that was like, you know, minor league ball until you get a chance to get mm-hmm. in there. But I remember like the night that we auditioned. Yeah. At the improv, and by that time I was hardened and I was ready to go. And I had a monster because a monster um, set? set to do because I had I had a monster. I remember like because Jay Leno, Bob Fisher, our Bob old manager, Fisher was another a, talent manager in the San Francisco scene who identified yeah. could identify talent. So yeah. you're going to make it, and I'm never wrong. It's just nice to hear that. Wow, that's nice to hear. Yeah, and, did you have a surefire when you auditioned? Did like I, what, a bit yeah. that kind of always Elvis killed. on a fish hook? Yes, yeah, so I had to share I had that with stuff. our listeners. <laughs> I had stuff. With, I'll give you one uh, of his. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, let's, go ahead. Dude, that well, was on a fish well, hook. It was like, it was like uh, uh, it's a visual. God, I forget the exact thing, but it was a it was a thing where you could act it out, right. where you did oh, an impression oh, and could act it out, and it was an interesting idea. Because you did a really good idea. Elvis. Yeah. So I did like I was. Um, you know, Elvis is what, when I first, before, you know, I was always into Monty Python, and by the time Saturday Night Live came in, it was over. I was into it. Mm-hmm. Cheech and Chong, it was over with. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was in this for life. And uh, But the thing that for performing, the, the guy that was I was turned on by most as a performer was Elvis. Mm-hmm. Just because of like- Such a stud. You know, the album, 100 million- Fans can't, can't be wrong. Be wrong. Yeah. Unreal. It's like, well, that's true. <laughs> it's oh, unreal. They can't. No. He's a, he's a, a that's like a, an Undeniable. entire population of Western culture, of that. Western society. And so, well, what? And, and then his performance and his, you know, his. Um, you know everything. He everything. had this, and you played Tiny Love Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> oh, you yeah. played Tiny Elvis. Right. So I would literally just sing Elvis songs and try to get his moves and stuff. And can you? Be, I know you're, you're, you're kind of shy. Tiny Elvis. Elvis. Yeah, give, me little, give me a little bit. Get um, on the mic. Yeah. Oh, hold me close, hold me tight, make me thrill with delight. Let me know where I stand from the start. <laughs> Want you? I need you. I love you. Well, oh, and then he would do this. Oh my, my god! Ha, 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 ha. He would, you know. So he was just like killer. He it, dug it, deep. Girls that. That was would, a gem. That would was lose good. their, you know. I mean, it, and they go crazy. They would go nuts. They go crazy and, when you would sing. You do it now or never. <laughs> and, I remember watching. And I did that at high school, and after practice, and then it just murdered so hard. Oh, that yeah. That it was like that was it. Can and I, I say uh, one thing right here? <laughs> you kind of around in here. You look like Elvis. You have a, a little a bit little of an Elvis yeah. overlap a little with bit your of cheeks something. and yeah. your mouth. Thank you. It, it's a yeah. little something that kind of works. So when yeah. I put the fake sideburns on and, yeah. and and I had the jumpsuit on, even at 115 pounds, my wrestling weight. And they called you Tiny Elvis? And they no. it was Tiny Elvis. When you, but and you then went I did to- it. And it murdered because people, it was yeah. a really good performance. The difference is a really good impression performed mm-hmm. really well, mm-hmm. seriously. Yeah. yeah. That commitment to it. It's just like when like uh, Napoleon Dynamite, that dance he does is really funny, but he's really committing to it and it's really yeah. good. Yeah. So that's the combination of stuff. And then it just naturally, if you're naturally funny, then people are like laughing at but it. But when you went to Japan to do Elvis for a couple of months. <laughs> that was a complete. Yeah. But were you playing, you were playing a serious Elvis, you, were you adding I jokes? Wasn't, I mean, first of all, yeah, I got the phone call and that's the time I was living in an apartment. <laughs> this is unreal. $200 this is a, a month. $200 a month. Basically what happened that's was- it? I was living in a place that, and it was just a hole in the wall. But what happened was Milt Abel, the comedian from San Francisco. I, I wrote his name down. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down Milt Abel because I wanted guy. to give some props to our- And, and our, he's an awesome yeah, guy. Really good kiddo. comedian. He had mm-hmm, jokes that I remember to this day. Like, you know, somebody tries to hand you a, a flyer and they go, no, mm-hmm. you throw it away. And it's just, just that little, good yeah, little yeah. one line. Like, ah, I wish great, I would have thought of that. Comment. And yeah. so I lived, I moved into this place. He said, it's $200 a month, blah, blah, blah. The first month I was in there, 
the uh, the eighty five year old Russian landlord who owned the place. He said, "So I am not." And then I had one one <laughs> Can bowl. We hear the landlord. I I like, like, That's going to be this, funny. Already. This is the old guy who's 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 owns the place and he lives there. And it says it's a shithole. The whole place is like been painted <laughs> once in the fifties. But I don't need it. I just literally put a mattress in there, just the one mattress. And then this is it. And I'm just going to do stand up and write coffee. It was right down the street uh, from uh, you know, uh, Fillmore, his coffee mm-hmm. shop. Yeah. So this is perfect. So I pay the. He said, "Only takes cash." So 200 bucks, perfect. Sketch. And then I, I remember like one of the, I only had one light and it was like a 30 foot ceiling. Cause you know what those old places are subdivided, subdivided, subdivided. And there used to be an old giant Victorian in the day. And then they turn it into like, f- you know, 13 apartments mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And so uh, the one bulb that was at the ceiling, the one light that I had, I didn't even have a lamp. It went out. And I was like, well, I got to have that. You know, I have my one light. You need a light. (laughs) I got to have a light. So I, you know, I don't know where to go. And um, (laughs) Mill's asleep. But I said, well, I just go. I knock on the guy's door, the landlord. And I go, well, you know. The lights out. What I, do. <laughs> I, uh, I okay. I can, I'm going to have to go down and get the get the ladder. I got downstairs to get the ladder. I come up. I can up. And then he came up. You know, and you just, I come I'm, up. Just, I'm just, I'm just this dummy because it's like I'm watching an eight, and then I realized I'm watching an 85 year old man on a 20 foot ladder climbing up to change the light bulb. And I was like, ah, and I'm watching it. And then I thought, well, he's already up there. <laughs> Let <laughs> him just get it. Now. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. I mean, you he's can right. spot him. And he comes down and says, I don't feel so good. I don't feel good. Mm-hmm. I've never felt like this. <laughs> I'm like, really? I, said, well, I don't know what to tell you. You know, he's <laughs> a week later, he's dead. Oh my God. Died a week later. And the thing was though, that he had no living relatives in anything, and so nobody was asking for rent. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I went from two hundred dollars a month to nothing to zero. Yeah. I had nothing, so I was living in a place for rent free. Did you push him off your floor at all? <laughs> I think I may changing <laughs> the light may uh, have killed him. I don't know, but I did realize like I should not have an eighty-five year old guy changing the bulb. It's weak and a But anyway, so okay, the landlord so, dies. Landlord. Now, how does this lead to Japan? Yeah. So what happened was I get a phone call. Uh, from um, another funny voice, Mark. Uh, uh, yeah, Mark. <laughs> this Mark, is funny it, voice. The McGee. Filipino community, whether you're half Filipino or right, whatever, right, right. There's a small community of people, and they try to like you know because they know that the Filipinos they'll work hard and they'll show up because otherwise mm-hmm. you'll be you'll be you've been great nurses. You, you do, do work yes. hard. Great they, they'll, nurses. they'll beat the shit out of you. You're, you're, it's been beat into you. You better work hard. You better yeah. show up. If you say this, you got to do this. And yeah, 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 all right. And so you can depend on Filipinos. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, like <laughs> if you do get a Filipino to come over to your house while you're moving, they'll move to. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. all day, Great. you know, and if you have somebody like, they'll take your blood pressure. Yeah, the mark that so I get a call from him and he says, uh, hey, listen, um, you do Elvis, right? And it's like, it's, he's calling me at nine in the morning, which Some I just want to sleep man. at like four. You do Elvis, you, right? You, you, you sing Elvis, right? He, good, said, good, good. Okay. he saw me do the, the Elvis and yeah, knew about yeah. it in high school. And so I said, yeah, yeah. He said, do you know the song? I said, I, I, you know, I know a couple, like three. So why? Why? He said, well, our, we just <laughs> lost our Elvis impersonator. And I said, what do you mean you lost it? Well, we, he, in Japan, they were sending a band for a, a new club that's opening. And he said, can you go to Japan to do Elvis? And I said, listen, I only know like three songs. And I don't really, it's not really serious, you know? And I don't, I don't really. <laughs> do anyway, sound it, like I'm not. So I called Bob Fisher and Bob says, do it. You'll tell, you'll tell, tell the story on Letterman one day. And so and I, I called Mark and I realized I don't even have a passport. You know, I've never mm-hmm. like, you know, I think I had left the country when I was a little like 13 sure. with my parents. I it was one of those cheapy you know, European tours where you go on a bus and, and um, you know, they take you to the worst, worst hotels in, in, in all of Europe. So that was it. So I had to get, I said, I don't have a passport. I can't Can go. Can you use the dead Russian landlord's passport? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I'm in a drawer. I think, oh, where's this going? So okay. he said, he said, just go to the, the, this Japanese woman, she's just go to Japantown. And and she'll take care of the. They can take care of the Japanese if they want to get something done. They get it done, you know. They, they, so they, <laughs> they, 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 the they, Irish? They, they, they conquered. They, you know, they, they they basically took all of Asia in in a month, and um, so they, they'll do this. So uh, I go over there, and she looks at me, and she goes, "Ah, oh, his, his name wasn't Mark. It was Alex. I'm sorry, Alex Howergy was his name." He said, she looked, and he said, "She looked at me when I walked in. She she with a fright in her eyes, and like, oh, no. I never trust Alex again." Because you're the Elvis? Because it's like, I'm like, this short guy coming to be an Elvis, you know? And <laughs> but you had puffy hair. Up. You had like Elvis. Yeah, so, but, yeah. And I said to her right there, again, my stand-up experience after doing it for a couple of years, yeah, yeah. I said, no, 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 I can do this. I'd be all right. I can do it. And they had no alternative. They had nobody it's like else. like a movie. And so it's, yeah, literally it's like a Friday down. and I got to fly <laughs> Sunday to, to do this for the next week. And so the next thing I go, oh, I'll just do it. It'll be fun. And I get on the plane and I start going over these- um, 
songs songs and stuff and we're like i don't really know this and it's then uh, now never. alex is like hey listen just where you're going kumamoto is like the alabama of japan they don't speak english just do the same verse over and over again they're not gonna know the difference so i said yeah, all right, right. right i'll just do that but then i realized no, you can't just do that. Mm -hmm. these, these are Elvis fans. Yeah. Even if they don't speak English, they're going to Teleprompter, cue cards. <laughs> yeah, this is way before yeah. any of that stuff for uh -huh. me. So anyway, on the way over there, I start getting a little bit nervous about it. And I go, ah, I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, what the big deal? It's just Japan. And like, what? Well, I'm never going to come back to this place. I land there. There's a bus that picks us up, a bus with posters all over the bus that says, Elvis, new Kennedy house, anything Japanese, you know, like anything oh the Japanese loved any American words like Kennedy, Elvis, you know, <laughs> yeah. Nixon, whatever they had. Nixon, <laughs> Elvis, Barry Kennedy Goldwater. house. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> Goldwater. So then we, the, I, then I, I, we get on the bus and they drive us straight to go see the, the Kazu guy, which is like a mobster guy. And he, he looks at me too. Kaza guy? Ka Kazu or whatever. It's a yeah. Japanese. Okay. It's, For mobster. He's the guy in charge, whatever. Mm -hmm. He's like the, the guy. Fuck that. And so he looks at me and says, you sing now. You sing now. You Elvis? And he looked at me. You, you sing, sing now. You he's sing got, now. He's got a funny voice too. You sing now. You sing now. He's got hitmen around uh, him and everything. <laughs> he just looked like a dangerous little guy. So what around did you, what did you do? He made tapper. me sing right there. He took us out to eat. Acapella? And he made me sing. He, no, he made me like go to the place. And it's I said, I'm going to have some time. He took, literally, after we ate, he took me to the club and I said, okay, I got some time because the club's not done. It's just, it's like mm -hmm. the walls aren't there, the floors. Then, oh, did sure. you have one go-to Elvis song Here, you know? Huh? Did you have one go-to Elvis song that you did in your acting? You know, like now or never used to do. Yes, um, uh, it's like uh, a Hound Dog or Blue oh, Suede yeah. Shoes. But the um, so anyway, we go to the place. It's not done. I said oh, I'm going to have Sorry. time to learn these songs because the floor is not in. There's no way it's going to open tonight. But the thing is, in Japan, if you're not done, they make you pay. If you're a construction whatever company, oh, really? they make you pay for every hour you're late. You oh, pay fines. Above here. So they did finish it that night. And then the problem was, it was three shows that night. Fuck off. And four on weekends. After the first show, the first night, I blow my voice out. I said, I can't do this. And this, oh. I go running into the sushi no, place, which is every every restaurant there, and just start just <laughs> sh just shoving down ginger. Uh, go to Seven uh, Eleven, eat sushi, uh, ginger, and ginger, and just I, I get through the second show, and I and then the third show, I don't know how I survived it. I, said, I, I never got to do it again. Oh, I'm like this the next day, and I don't know how I'm going to do it again. Did you kill? And the, it was good. It was okay. You know, there was enough people you, on the weekends. Is there a was little packed. band or karaoke? Or? We had like they they flew me over with a band, a and little band playing. But but okay. anyway, by, by like, and I said, well, you got to figure it out, and then. But it was, uh, and sure enough, I did uh, do the, um, I did, my first Letterman appearance was, uh, I did, I did, um, he said, uh, so you were Elvis in Japan. <laughs> what was that like? And then, <laughs> so he did ask me a question. I didn't wow. have a really good. Uh, it's still um, funny because you did Elvis on a fish hook on your first set, right? Yeah. that was Going like, full circle. So that, that Elvis was really, and then Elvis on a fish hook was just one of those quick hit. But yeah. I, I could do a really good Elvis, so that would like it help him. Oh, I, I know what it was like. I don't know. Maybe I said, now I would just introduce it just you know, like a, at that time, if you did odd stuff unconnected, yeah, it was kind of interesting. That was yeah, like a, a style that. at that yeah, time. Yeah. It's like, and now uh, I'd like to do my impression of Elvis on a fish hook. And on a fish hook. And I go, oh, Sonny Red, I don't know. I'll maybe come back here one of these days and get some, ah, you know. Ah. And I would do that. And <laughs> I would go back and like he's a fish hook. His he lip just, curls up and he tilts his head and, and lifts up. Like yeah, he got, yeah, got a laugh. Fish. But that was the thing. That, like when I did that, at that set that we did. Yeah. And, you know. Auditioning for SNL probably. Yeah. And it was just one of those things you got a big laugh. It was interesting. And Lauren said later, um, you know, when I, um, <laughs> if I see something brilliant, um, I know that there's uh, the potential um, to repeat it. Yeah. And I said, am I hired? And I guess no, that was the way no, of being hired. No, just that Elvis on a fish hook will be like, like a runner. I, I don't know if it's a talk show. You talk to Jim Downey. Well, you also used to do reading from Elvis. I mean, I, actually, your act was very unique. When you say, it's you just said a little bit ago. You go, I should try not to have the material like everyone else. That wasn't my motto, but you did because you actually did that. You also did also reading from 
The first time I met Elvis. <laughs> yeah. Elvis and me with Priscilla was funny. An impression, if you're not good at it, just doing something that's completely not good it at all is also yeah. works. Who was that? That was Priscilla. That's Priscilla. <laughs> now, oh, I said, oh, 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 okay, I got you. Yeah. I read the book, Priscilla Priscilla Presley wrote a and book you called just Elvis like, and Me. Yeah. Yeah. And I swear to God, when I was reading it, I started reading it out loud to people. And they were just howling, just laughing. So so maybe what I was could the do voice you used for Priscilla? It was, uh, I would just talk like this, which is a kind of like a version of like my mother. Yeah. My mother also, she would never, it she didn't understand- yeah, the mother from, from Baguio, which is like the mountains mm-hmm. of the Philippines. Uh, she wouldn't understand jokes, but she would understand how to laugh at the right time. She'd go, ha, <laughs> Your mom. <laughs> Marvin. Very What sweet. does it mean? What does it mean? I don't understand. You know, when he said, he goes, when you were, uh, one of your jokes was, um, I'll mangle it. When you were a little kid, when you were eight years old, you banged your head on the coffee table and your mom would make you feel good and she'd go hit it and she goes, bad coffee table, bad. <laughs> and she goes, and you'd feel better. And she goes, we make it even, bad coffee table and hit it. And then you go to bed and your dad wakes you up at two in the morning and goes, hey, Rob, get on down here. Your mom spilled hot wax on the coffee table. We got to make it even. You know our policy. Oh, yeah. So then you have to <laughs> so have hot wax like, yeah, filled on you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That was the idea, yeah. <laughs> they got to make it even. <laughs> but I remember like if you if I did that, you know when you do a character, it's like mm-hmm. you can do your jokes and you get it, but when you do a character, it's just another. Also in the middle of the joke, you're yes. playing and also people. you uh, you had a musicality too. You had a rhythmic Very musicality from the early days and we're hearing it Thank now, you. which is also, I like the whole is great in the sum of the parts of musical rhythms. Oh, like yeah. getting copy. What um, was? How do you hit that? It was just so infectious. Making copy, you know, it, like it, that. There's a musicality yeah. to it. Yeah, it sings. It's got to sing. Like, it's a song. How did you? Yeah, now let's it. get to that part. We, Rob and I, fast forward. We get we get hired on SNL. We audition at Catch Rising Star. I think. Well, the first one we did at the Melrose. Okay, and then like the we scariest the part was like. At that time, I kind of had like a, a little bit of a fuck you attitude in, the, in a good way because you have to because you get otherwise you get beaten down. You're, you're so too, like, no, and I yeah, said, you know what? I, and he said, and then I got the call from Bernie. You know, uh, <laughs> um, Lauren, Lauren. He managed to put extra syllables in that one. Lauren, one <laughs> to meet you. And I said, well, <laughs> he'll want, you know, Bob, Robert Stallone Smigel. his son? <laughs> Stallone, the, yeah. Smigel did a funny thing where he just like, where he, uh, it was just, you know, you take it's so exaggerated and yeah. Robert was like um let me eat your foot I don't know how it got there but yeah. his his Bernie impression was, I want to eat your I want, I want to eat your foot and Bernie I was a heavy guy he's no like Santa Claus anything. <laughs> that's the thing he told me the first day yeah. no one fucking knows anything in this business and later on Brad Gray said I told him why is he saying that because it's like you know give me 15% of <laughs> yeah, that he don't thing. Thing. I, don't, I don't know fucking nothing <laughs> now give me a check <laughs> you know, it's true so, I, he, so the next day he said Lauren wants to meet Lauren. you Lauren and I said well I got a gig in San Diego and I said, mm-hmm. he knows. Um, I'm middling. I get a gig in San yeah. Diego. And he said, he'll, he'll know uh, what it's like. If you have a, a job, he'll respect it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and he said, if he wants to meet me, he'll fly me to New York. You know, and, and, and that was very, and I just said that in the Ballsy. morning. As I'm driving down to San Diego, I have the cold sweats. And I literally like, I just fucked up everything. Yeah, Why didn't I sure. meet? And I really had, and but in the back of my mind, it was the right thing. And the only person he flew out of all those people audition was me to New York to meet you them. flew over me while I was driving <laughs> <laughs> David was you know, yeah he was getting ready to move furniture because he had to go back and, and forth they every hired summer. us as a writing team it, I remember you guys a, coming in like freaking yeah practice. it was a they, weird they, scene Bernie said not. they're a writing team you gotta hire them both I was not aware that I, I didn't want to first of all I didn't want to be a writer I wanted to write but be a performer and that was hard. And that's what I was saying about Copy Machine. We did those four shows. Even Dennis said, Spudley, you don't get anything on. I think it's curtains. <laughs> I'm like, and it was only fucking four shows. I go, there's no fucking chance. I did get a Michael J. Fox on, on the Dice Clay show. Oh. And Kenny Among, who I love, says, David, I forgot to put you at the beginning. I go, what does that mean? He goes, I didn't put your card up where it says, featuring David Spade. And I go, it wasn't there? And he goes, yeah, so no one knew who you were. <laughs> and I go, God damn, I okay, one it's a, shot. It's a tradition on the podcast. Just 10 seconds of Michael J. Fox, Casualties of War. Sarge. Actually, I just give you a one. <laughs> no, you're down to one seconds. syllable. Um, he's seen it too many times. Oh, so I do Michael okay. J. Fox. And then, uh, and then sorry, we have the summer sorry, listeners. And yeah. then Rob and I get hired back. They, yeah, wait, they was, always wait a while. It was a little touch and goy because we didn't get anything on. But I remember yeah. like I, I would do anything. Like they said, like, write... Um, 
Promos. Promos, which yeah. is like that. Why are they letting me write promos? I've never written a promo yeah. in my life. So this is awesome. It's fucking jury, and you realize dude. no one wants to write the promos. Yeah. And so I went and they said, you know, and Lauren was, I mean, I was just blown away by the fact that Lauren would even talk to me. And of then course. he said like, and then, you know, it's, um, you know, just, um, and you have to write it. You, you'll write promos. And then- um, No explanation English, either. You just right got to figure it out. So then, then, and so I went in and Deborah Winger- was the, the host of the whole show. Oh, wow. sure. Remember her. And I went in and, and Jack Handy wrote a great sketch with her, even though she was very fragile. I walk into her dressing room. She's there sitting <laughs> Sorry, with Lauren Deb. on the floor. <laughs> and she's literally crying going, I can't believe <laughs> you talked me into doing this. I just, I, I'm not good. I can't. I, and, and I was just like, whoa, is this like this every week? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I would have gone in Travolta, uh, you know, for her, like from what that Western or was that Urban Cowboy. Go ahead. You know, like I kind of think I might be falling in love with you, or something like that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> See, that was the day of Bubba Dana too. Is that he he would hit the you know in his stand up too. He's like the turns he would make. Yeah. By the time he would be like like a, a, a NASCAR or racer, you know, a driver, and all of a sudden, and by the end of his routine, because he would do the stuff, but then he would pummel the audience. It was like a boom, 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 boom. Mm -hmm. and by the end he would go from one impression to another impression, and then the impressions are talking to each other, and the audience <laughs> can't breathe. It was like a, it was literally like a meditative thing for that. Jeez, I, I said, gotta, holy shit. I'm going to listen to this Robbie, podcast. So that's very nice, Rob. But, but that is we what can all cut all that that's out. That's what was the influence um, with me. David wants to make an edit yeah. now. Just uh, No, <laughs> just anything about Dana we're going to take out. Pumble, uh, pumble, pumble. Rob, when we were, at, I think those four I, shows. I, I just got to use the restroom real quick. I'm just sorry. I said, can I use the restroom real quick? Yeah, yeah. Just one. Yeah, go through the back room. Dana, you no, started we'll, stand up. Oh. Rob's going to go away. We don't have to stop it. We can just wait, right? Oh, we keep going. Rock, He's so Rock weird. Using the restroom. I know. That's really smart. Talk about Deuce Bigelow. <laughs> <laughs> What does that mean? Like he's, he's taking gonna, it too. Like he's going to unload? Yeah, he's got to. He's, <laughs> he's getting the unload the, chamber. There's a bathroom right here too. Do you know that? That you don't have to go in the back bedroom? I just where, I guess where did you go? I went to the very oh, back. That's Dana's bathroom. You You're not go going again. You I just wanted to let you know. Mm -hmm. And they're hanging a mirror in there so you can even. Mm. You can watch yourself. It's just either one. Audio only podcast. <clears throat> no, it's right by the grocery store. If you go through this hall. <laughs> There's a little mini Ralph's. It's a pop-up. You go through that. Sorry, Sarge. Hey, Sarge. Hey, Sarge. I got it. It's Casey Kasem. I got to do it. <laughs> hey, Sarge. I, I, yeah, don't, hey, Sarge. I have to get a new one. Dude. We don't have that many runners. That's just a great That's runner. That's a great runner. No you got one. tired of it. You know what uh, Nikki Glazer said about your set the other night, that you, you should do more of that Bill Gates bit. and um, On the island. Yeah, it was yeah, funny. I just, I was just and do more Clinton. Like, oh, you see those pictures? I, cut, I, I, I got them for you. I was bailing because I, did, I was just doing concepts. I was bailing because a lot. You no, know? but they like they were oh, so God, excited. The pictures and the videos I saw made it look like it was like the best show. I did ever. keep some of those pictures to well, send I you. I did get a standing ovation, but to me, that's not good enough. We, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because I did Chopping Broccoli on the piano where I wrote Chopping yes. Broccoli. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You did a standing ovation, but they found out that guy worked there. Do, 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 do. Do, do. <laughs> you came up, and no. I knew on the way out, all I heard was roaring. Well, they Trust what happened was the other night, if we're still crushing. on, is that Dana came down to do the improv the other night, and uh, he's doing hosting uh, a show coming up, so he's practicing. Hadn't done stand-up in three years in a club. Three years in a club. Uh, they We put him as a special guest, and then uh, I went after him, but went up, great, read some stuff off a notepad. Everyone was enchanted. Funny premises, big laughs, closes hard. And then I went up, but everyone was like, psst, psst, Dana, Dana. So well, that's good excited. if she liked that. I like the premise of Bill Gates on pre you know, Epstein's Island yeah. being awkward. Yeah, hey, good. what are you doing here? <laughs> I'm just like putting it on sunscreen. We're going to go by the pool. You want to go? Hey, guys. Rob is still in the bathroom. And um, I know that's exciting news, but uh, let's roll that videotape. Part two. Uh, well, he's in the bathroom doing part one. If he, does, <laughs> if he does part two, we'll let you know. But right now, I'm here to say that on Friday, part two of Rob Schneider's epic appearance on Fly on the Wall. After the bathroom. Let's drop. look at a clip. Yeah. This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13, executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. 
The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 